Good day students, you're all welcome to our physics class for today. I shall be introducing to you a very familiar concept, an interesting concept at that. It is projectiles and projectile motion. I'm sure you all play football or you do one sport or the other. Some of you, I'm sure you play basketball, you play football, lawn tennis, table tennis, and uh, ball games. Now, the path in which these balls take when you kick them is quite interesting. Today, I want to expose you to the physics behind it. And these objects, by virtue of their motion in air, when they are kicked, they are referred to as projectiles. But before then, I would like to hear from you. Probably you've come across the word projectiles before. So let me have your views about what a projectile is. Projectile can be defined as an object or a body which when launched into air follows a parabolic path from its source. Now, when an object is shot or thrown or released or launched into air and then allowed to move freely in a parabolic path, there is just one force that is acting on that object. And that force is the force of gravity. Take for instance, this is a ball. If I release this ball, there are two ways I could release this ball. I can release it from a height. I can also project it or throw it from a point. Now, if I release this ball and allow it to fall freely under the influence of gravity only, this ball is said to be a projectile. If you've used a catapult before, by the time you release your stone, you don't follow the stone, do you? By the time you throw your basketball to make your basket, do you follow it? Now it proceeds freely into air without any other force acting on it except gravity. So that basketball at that point in time is said to be a projectile. The stone that flies freely is said to be a projectile. The ball that is released freely is said to be a projectile. Therefore, we can define a projectile as any object that is propelled or thrown into air and then allowed to move freely under the influence of gravity only. Now, there is a condition. Of course, you know that if I release this ball into air, I'm not going to stop the air from acting against it, isn't it? It is going to be acting against air. Now, there is going to be a force of resistance due to air. However, it is negligible because comparing the mass of the ball and the mass of the air or the force of the air against the ball, the mass of the ball is quite large compared to the mass of the air. Therefore, we neglect the resistance due to air. Is that understood? Yes. So that's what a projectile is. Now, next, I would love us to mention examples of projectiles. So, can we have examples of projectiles? An example of a projectile can be a kickball in motion. An active a high jump. A high jumper. A high jumper is a projectile at the point of jumping. That's beautiful. Now, of all the examples you have mentioned, some are used in sports, others are used in warfare. For instance, the stone, you've not, you didn't mention the arrow, you did mention the, uh, the bullet. The bullet is used in warfare. Therefore, we can have examples of projectiles under sports and warfare. We have a kicked football, we have a thrown basketball, a thrown javelin, a battered badminton shuttle, a high jumper, a battered ping pong ball. You all know a ping pong ball, don't you? A tennis ball. Then we also have a thrown shot put. For warfare, we have a bullet shot from a gun, a thrown spear, a shot arrow, a stone released from a catapult. These are other examples of projectiles. We have a bus driven off an uncompleted bridge, a moving plane in air with, its, with the engines, disconnected, any object in space at all that is under the influence of gravity only is referred to as a projectile. I would like us to look at projectile motion. We have already listed examples of projectiles. I want us to look at the motion. How do they move? How do they move? Now, the study of projectile motion is referred to as ballistics. The path of a projectile is quite caught, isn't it? Look at it. Look at the part of this ball. It's caught, isn't it? Very good. Now, the curved part is taking the shape of a parabola. 
Therefore, the part can be said to be parabolic, but technically it's called, the part of a projectile is called its trajectory. The, a trajectory is the path of a projectile, and usually it is parabolic. Is that understood? Very good. So next, I would like us to look at the picture. This is an object that is dropped from a point. It is falling under the influence of gravity only. The man who released this stone is at state here, while the stone is traveling freely under gravity. This stone has been projected from this point. It got to a, a maximum point, and then it started returning. For all of the motions are done freely under the influence of gravity only. You can see this. This is a trajectory. The parabolic path. This is the parabolic path of a projectile. Now, I would like us to examine in details projectile motion. We can, dis we, can, we can divide projectile motion into two components. Because, for instance, if you project a ball into space, you are not projecting it directly vertical. Look at it. This is not directly vertical. You're projecting it in a slant position. It therefore means that it has two components. It has a vertical component, and it has a horizontal component. Now, projectors are usually projected with an initial velocity. All right? They are projected with an initial velocity. So I would like us to look at um, the vertical and horizontal components of the initial velocity. If you look at this diagram, this is the initial velocity u with which the projectile is projected. And then it is projected with an angle theta to the horizontal. The angle here is called the launch angle, or the angle of inclination. Whereas uy here is the vertical component of the initial velocity. And ux here is the horizontal component of the initial velocity. Now what I want us to do now is to determine the magnitude of the vertical and horizontal components of the initial velocity. Now we can simply do that by transforming this diagram into a right angle triangle such that we can use trigonometric ratios to find the magnitudes of ui and ux respectively. Yes, can we have someone do that? From this diagram, as it's stated, if you want to find the vertical component, since this is implying that an angle here, it means that if I trace a line here, this whatever I have here will be called whatever I have here. So I can constantly clean this off and then maintain this type and form a proper right angle triangle. And I have theta here, I have ui here, and I have ux here. So to find an resultant is u. To find ui, I know that. And using the different trigonometric functions, I can use sine, so that which is so that is opposite to my hypotenuse. The opposite is this, we can call it V. So it means that sine theta is equal to V over U. So to find V on its own, V will be equal to U sine theta. Now for the Horizontal component, I can call it H. Now, still using the geometric ratio, I can use the cosine, which is adjacent over the hypotenuse. And since this side is adjacent, so it can be completely used. So it means that cos theta will be equal to H, which is the adjacent side of the line, and H, which is the horizontal component, is equal to L, U cos. He has done very well. Please clap for him. <laughs> However, let me explain what he has done. Now, when you are doing vector diagrams, you need to use arrows because you are considering the magnitude and direction of a quantity. Now, if this is the vertical component of the initial velocity, we call it u, y, and the horizontal component is called u, x because it is in the x direction, this is in the y direction. Now, if you project an object from the ground with an initial velocity u and with an angle theta to the horizontal, you can find the magnitude of u, y, and u, x. Now, how do you do that? 
This is the vertical component of the initial velocity. You can as well represent it on this other side. So this is as good as UY. Now, considering this right angle triangle from point O to A to B, we can find the magnitude of UY and UX. How is that? From here, we can apply trigonometric ratios. You all remember Sokatoa. So, ka, toa. This is sine opposite over hypotenuse. Now, if you are going to take the sine of this angle, sine theta is going to be equal to uy over the hypotenuse, which is u. So if you cross multiply to make uy the subject of formula, you have what? u sine theta. This is the magnitude of the vertical component of the initial velocity. Similarly, we can find the magnitude of the horizontal component by taking cosine of the angle. So if we take cos theta, we are going to have adjacent over hypotenuse. That is ux over u. If we cross multiply successfully, we are going to have ux to be equal to u cos theta. And this is the horizontal component of the initial velocity. So the magnitude of the horizontal and vertical components of the initial velocity can be represented by these following equations, equation one and equation two. Do you understand? So we shall be using this to solve problems. But before then, I want to tell you about the velocity and acceleration of a projector. If you examine the motion of a projector, there is only one force we have said is acting on it, and that force is gravity. The direction of gravity usually is downwards. If you are looking at the acceleration of a projector, look at this diagram. This projector has been projected from this point. There is an acceleration because gravity is acceleration due to gravity, isn't it? That is acceleration due to free fall, due to the gravitational force within the Earth's gravitational field. Is that understood? So it is usually acting downwards. It means that a projector has no horizontal acceleration. And if you look at this diagram here, you can see that it has a vertical velocity as far as the object is tending to move downwards due to gravity. However, the horizontal component of the velocity remains the same. Why is it the same? It remains the same because there is no horizontal acceleration. Because as soon as you project an object in space, you don't follow it. So it is falling freely. And it is falling freely due to gravity. Therefore, the acceleration is tilting downwards because gravity tilts downwards. Is that understood? So the horizontal velocity is always constant. Take note of that. Now, we are going to use these equations which we have derived to look at certain basic terms that are used in projectors. One, we have time of flight. Two, we have the maximum height. And then we have the range. The basic terms are time of flight, maximum height, and range. Now, this is a diagram showing uh, the path of a projector. Projected with an initial velocity u, and these are the, uh, this is the vertical component, this is the horizontal component. The magnitudes are attached, as you can see. Now, when the projector gets to a highest point, you give it an initial velocity. But as it ascends, because it is moving in a direction that is against gravity, the velocity tends to decrease. Do you understand? If you project it upwards, the velocity decreases. If you give it a velocity, for instance, give it a, an initial velocity of 30 meters per second, by the time it gets to the maximum point, just before it gets to the maximum point, um, the velocity decreases, and then at the maximum point, it's equal to zero. That is the initial velocity. And then it makes a U-turn returning back to the horizontal level. Do you understand? This is the point where the final velocity is equal to zero. And then it makes a U-turn coming back to the earth. Are you getting it? Now, the time when it gets to the maximum height is referred to as maximum time. That is the maximum time. And then the total time 
it gets to the maximum height and, re and, and returns back to the horizontal plane is referred to as the time of flight. That is the total time taken from the point of projection to the point where the projectile lands again. The second concept is maximum height. The maximum height here is simply the highest vertical point attained above the ground. And then there is a horizontal distance here from the point of projection to where the projectile lands again. That distance is referred to as range. Look at range here. This is range. The distance from here to here is called range. It is denoted with capital letter R. Total time of flight is denoted with capital letter T. And then the maximum height is denoted with capital letter H. All right? Now, this is the equation for time of flight. 2u sine theta all over g. For maximum height, we have u squared sine squared theta all over 2g. And r, we have u squared sine 2 theta all over g. I expect you to ask me, how did we arrive at these equations? First of all, let's look at the equation 1, which is the time of flight. When an object is moving along a straight path, this is linear motion. Is that understood? But when an object is moving freely in space, the motion is no longer linear. It is motion under gravity. Is that understood? Now, we are going to transform these equations into equations for motion under gravity. Is that understood? Therefore, we can transform these equations into, for motion under gravity, we have 1. V here is the final acceleration, isn't it? Sorry, final velocity, right? Where this is the initial velocity, this is acceleration, and then this is time. So, for motion under gravity, what happens is, your acceleration is no longer a linear acceleration, but it is acceleration due to gravity. So it is represented with small letter g, OK? And then your distance here, when it comes to motion under gravity, you can have a vertical distance, which is what? Height. Height is denoted with h. Is that understood? And then when you have um, a horizontal distance, what is it called? It is called range. So we denote it with what? Capital letter R. So your S can be denoted or transformed into uh, H. It can also be written as um, R. Now, the first equation will now become V equals to U plus or minus, plus or minus, A will now be what? G, T. Why am I putting plus or minus? Now, look at this. When you project this ball upwards, and it takes this path, when it's moving upwards, your A is the same as gravity. However, because the, the object is moving in a direction that is opposite to the direction of gravity because that gravity is always acting downwards. Is that understood? So your A will now be equal to what? Minus G. That is what? Minus gravity. All right? By the time it gets to coming down, your A is in the same direction with the direction of gravity, isn't it? It's returning back to the Earth. So it's moving in the same direction with gravity. So this becomes what? Plus G. But what happens at this point? You give it an initial velocity u, which is maximum. Is that understood? That's the highest velocity you've given to it. When it gets to this point, what happens to the final velocity? The final velocity is zero. It therefore means that at the maximum point here, the final vertical velocity equals to what? Zero. Are you getting me? It becomes zero, and then it tends to fall down back to the Earth again. Is that understood? So using this concept, we are going to derive the equation for time of flight. For the time of flight, we know t is equals to 2u sine theta all over g. We know the terms t 
t is the time of flight, g is acceleration due to gravity, u is initial velocity, theta is the angle of inclination. Now, but before a projectile gets to its total time, which is time of flight, it gets to a time at maximum point. That time is known as time at maximum point. Is that understood? Yes. It's denoted with small letter t. It is u sine theta all over g. Now, if a projectile takes two minutes from the point of projection to the maximum height, under the condition of gravity only, it will take the same time from the point maximum height down to the projection plane again. Is that understood? Yes. That is neglecting uh, air resistance. So let's derive the equations. For time of flight, this is what we have. V is equals to u plus or minus gt to derive the time of flight. We know V is equals to u plus or minus gt. And we know the conditions that apply, all right? Good. Now, since this projectile is projected from the point and is taking a vertical motion upwards, these are the conditions that apply. At maximum height, the final velocity equals to zero. Isn't it? Now, the initial velocity is going to be the vertical component of the initial velocity with which it was projected. Is that understood? It was projected with an initial velocity u. But since it is ascending, we are going to consider the vertical component of the initial velocity, that is uy. Is that understood? So this is going to be u y. Therefore, our v will be equal to u y because it is ascending upwards plus or minus g t. Is that understood? First of all, we want to arrive at the maximum and uh, the time at maximum height. So whatever we get, we multiply it by two to get the time of flight. Is that understood? Therefore, Recall that uy is u sine theta. Is that understood? Now, going, getting back to our equation, since v is equals to 0, this becomes 0 equals to uy minus gt. Is that understood? Now, if that's the case, 0 will now be equal to uy is what? u sine theta. So we have u sine theta minus gt. Now, our aim is to find t, which is the time at maximum height. Is that understood? It therefore means that making t the subject of formula, we are going to have gt to be equal to what? u sine theta. So that t will be equal to what? t is going to be? u sine theta g. Very good. This is the time at maximum height. That is the time taken to reach this point. That is one phase of the motion. Now, when it gets to this point, it starts coming downwards. Because we are neglecting friction, and the object is moving under the same condition, which is just gravity, the time it takes to get to the maximum height is the same time it will take to move downwards because it is transcending through the same distance. Are you getting it? The distance in this direction and then in this direction is the same vertical distance. And it is moving under one condition, which is gravity. Do you understand? Therefore, the time of flight is going to be two times the time at maximum height. T will be equal to what? Two U sine theta all over G. This is time of flight. This is time at maximum height. This is the total time, which is the time of flight. This will be all for now. I wish you a lovely day.